Um, I am an anthropologist, but I work in a very particular setting now, uh, which is that thing, uh, MCTS, uh, the Munich Center for Technology and Society, which is basically an integrative uh, research center at the Technical University of Munich. Um, we are, in, in the particular professorship where I work, we are all anthropologists, uh, basically dealing with uh, issues of architecture, urbanism, and, and different forms of urban infrastructures. So, um, but I'm going to tell you about the before I came to this place, and uh, the kind of work I have been doing as part of, a de of an open design collective in Barcelona. Uh, called uh, Entorno a la Silla, around on the wheelchair, as I, will, I would like to show you. And I would like to tell you a little, a little bit about my engagement in that particular uh, design collective where I was the documenter. And I would like to, in a way, reflect on the role documentation played in the very practice of design of this collective. The effect, in a way, if you want to think about it, if you're, I don't know whether you are more anthropologists or artists, uh, but I mean, I wanted to create a space where we can, we could both of us mingle. Uh, for the anthropologists, this could be interesting in a way to think of forms in which ethnography can have an impact in the very settings and fields that we, that we study. For the artists, this could be, in a way, I have a feeling, uh, an interesting way of addressing how particular approaches to documentation uh, could have an impact on the way in which you're uh, undertaking your practical work as, I don't know, visual, visual artists or uh, graphic designers or whatever. Um, I have divided my presentation in, in three sections. I, would, I, should, I should basically say it's more two and a little bit. Uh, in the first one, I would like to tell you a little bit more about what we have been doing in, in Entorno a la Silla. In the second section, I plan, uh, in a way, to try to deal uh, with this thing, this subtitle, or even the title, Why Do I Call This a How-To Anthropology? And, and, and that will take me a bit uh, to unfold an inquiry into the effects of documentation in design practice. Something I was doing both as an ethnographer, as a documenter within the collective. But I will tell you a little bit more about that. And the little bit in the end will only be something that in a way this whole project, because I have been uh, part of Entorno La Silla since 2012 and I joined uh, the MCTS in Munich in 2015 where basically my duties beyond doing my own research work, I have been having to teach architects um, so that they would be uh, more aware of the social consequences or even the social milieus in which they are operating. Um, so I will end up, for those who might be a bit interested, uh, showing you how we could do sort of the reverse gesture. I mean, instead of just being anthropologists, going to the places where everyone is already politicized, how could we turn uh, designers, architects in training into more politicized actors? Uh, and um, I will show, show you one particular intervention from the last semester, the summer semester from, from this very year, where we have been trying to uh, create a context for that to happen. And we call that, uh, that course uh, Designing Crisis, which is part of a series of courses we have been teaching in the last, in the last uh, year, year and a half. But the, the, the thing is that before I can tell you why we are so interested in putting design in crisis, I need to talk to you uh, a little bit more about the particular crisis where Entorno La Silla and the project I have been part of, in a way, emerged. And that will require me uh, to tackle one very particular set of documentary effects uh, within this collective called Entorno a la Silla, where the whole task, the whole practice of the collective was uh, something that in Spanish we call cacharrear, which in English would be tinkering. That is all we did, both in the design of gadgets and in the way of producing accounts. But I don't know how familiar you might be with the Spanish crisis of the last 10 years. 
Um, let me read out loud one thing I have uh, tried to, in a way, uh, where I have tried to express how it felt at the time. Like a distant storm, with its many flashes of warning around late 2008, Spaniards started talking about the crisis. The Spanish building market, one of the main industries of the country, had begun to, to stagnate. Its uncontrolled growth had certainly been connected to the global financial subprime bubble, but had also many local, legal, institutional and cultural aspects that started to unveil other vernacular crisis in the, pl in the plural. Later, the sparks, a heavy smell of ozone, thunderbolts, and the lightning in the sky. Slowly but steadily, over a few years, people started feeling the sound of thunder in their, in their lives, and suddenly the electrical impact on the ground, a, land and la uh, a landslide loss of jobs, which brought forth massive evictions, since many could not pay their houses' mortgages. This happened in the wake of a general impoverishment of the rapidly nascent, nascent middle class uh, since the 70s, who operated under an idea of welfare as never-ending growth after a badly digested transition to democracy. But also, there was a growing public discredit of the political class due to cascading cases of corruption and nepotism and massive youth unemployment. To make things worse, between 2010 and 2012, austerity measures supported by different European and international economic agencies and think tanks uh, set already austere welfare infrastructures on fire. And what was only to be uh, a particular demonstration where people were singing, no vas a tener una casa en tu puta vida, you're not going to have a house in your fucking life, um, uh, under the banner called Youth Without Future, Juventud Sin Futuro, and many other collectives, there was a, a demonstration called for the 15th of May in Madrid in 2011. But after police repression, uh, basically what we lived for the following 6 to 12 or even 18, 18 months uh, was something like what you're watching in this particular picture. This is Barcelona, this is Plaza de Catalunya, the main square in the city. Um, that is, people after police repression and believing that they were, in a way, treated like, um, treated, treated very, very badly by their public administrators and the different corporate uh, actors in the country, they said, we can't stand this thing anymore. So they started in creating these encampments these encampments were particularly interesting. They were like a city within the city. Uh, and many things started to develop in those encampments that, like I said, uh, in some places even lasted uh, more or less formally or informally or with a greater or lesser uh, degree of uh, emplacement in the encampment for months. People were sleeping in the, in the squares, people were living, breathing, and doing things together with others. Um, I was particularly interested in one group. Um, I mean, these encampments uh, were basically created something that in, in Spanish was called comisiones, commissions, or work groups. Uh, all of them were theme-based or topic-based. And the most interesting thing is that they were like, a, like an interesting window display for many types of activism in the country that were shown and shared in the very squares. So what I'm going to talk to you about is something that emerged out of the Functional Diversity Commission uh, that took place in Barcelona. Functional diversity is a very uh, vernacular term for, that was created in, in Spain in the early 2000s by disability, um, disability rights activists that no longer wanted to use the word disabled or people with disabilities. They believe that that creates a very stigmatizing identity for them even though it is the very cornerstone of the production of their rights. They wanted to have another term and that is how they coined in Spanish diversidad funcional, or in English functional diversity. 
They were saying, we are all functionally diverse. It is only some of us who are discriminated against because of our functional diversity. But if you think of what this implies, it's really interesting. I mean, it's not that we are normal, they are disabled. And then we should include them in our society. What they're saying is we are all functionally diverse. And if you're dis discriminating us, you're discriminating one of your own. So, and the interesting thing is that it's not, our, it's not our, your duty to include us. It should be everyone's duty to live together in diversity. Uh, that was how the whole Commission of Functional Diversity started. Um, seeking to make that happen in the encampments, living together in diversity. Uh, accessibility being something that was uh, a declination of the particular uh, democratic politics that people were playing with in, uh, joyfully, but at the same time in, in a very serious way. So they created debates, um, sessions to speak. They were living in the streets. And one of the things that they noticed is that in the streets, as they are designed right now, even following accessibility codes, it is very difficult to relate. It is very difficult to be together with one another. It is very difficult to remain in the street uh, for a few hours. And it's even more difficult if you then move to a pub or to a bar or to a cafe. And then you want to keep that conversation that started uh, in, the, in the streets. And you want to, in a way, prolong that into the, the terrace of a bar, as the many uh, terraces that you find in Barcelona. So they started thinking that they needed to go beyond the particular way in which the states operate here. Usually, in many European countries, we have different forms of private actors giving solutions for the weird bodily, the, the, the weirdly bodily uh, citizens. Um, and all they are, and these things are within a very particular market arrangement, the state basically subsidizes either their production or their consum consumption. But in most of the cases, if this is not what you're searching for, you have to pay it without uh, any kind of backing from the public administrations. And if what you're needing is something to be occupying the streets, it, will, it is very likely that you won't find it here. So they needed a, a bit more of a radical approach. And in order to keep on living together, they started intervening their very spaces. They needed to be together, to remain together. And in order to be together, they needed, like I said, to intervene the street. This particular thing was commissioned. I don't know whether you know about this, but um, I mean, in Barcelona every summer, in one of the districts called uh, Gracia, there are like popular festivities. And uh, in these popular festivities, every single street uh, competes against any other. Uh, in, I mean, basically disguising the facades of the buildings. And uh, basically they are playing to, in a contest to see whose facade is uh, more beautiful. But one of the things is that doing that, they are basically transforming or intervening in already very accessible uh, street designs as the ones that you can find, that you can find in, in, in Barcelona. Um, so the neighbors of this particular street, the Fraternitat Street in the Gracia district, commissioned some of the colleagues from the Functional Diversity Commission this particular ramp so that Sebastián Ledesma, that guy on a wheelchair, could enjoy the festivities, the social dinners that, that are hosted every night as, as well, I mean, as one another. Um, the interesting thing is that in these very particular political times um, that we lived um, something like six, seven years ago in Spain, uh, the ramp also had a message, a, a very particular message that has been accompanying us in the last years. La revolución será accesible o no será. Revolution will be accessible or it won't be. But the interesting thing is that there was a call for projects from uh, an institution in Madrid in 2012, uh, Medialac Prado. It's a very particular institution that has been fostering open, free culture in, in Spain, basically calling for many different kinds of collectives so that they could start prototyping devices 
But one of the main things that they basically uh, oblige, so to speak, everyone that goes through their institution and that receives their funding is that everything that is produced, every knowledge that is created through their funding has to be publicly restituted, it has to be returned through uh, the use of free, open, Libre licenses. Um, so that is the very reason why these designs are open. They are open because they can, they can and should be circulated, either the sketches or the process or even the very final prototype should be in the open, should be subjected to public scrutiny. It should be, it should be, I mean, you should spread the word about it from the very moment on. And one of, the, one of the people that basically went for these funding were three of the members of the Functional uh, Diversity Commission in Barcelona. Um, this, whole, this thing was to, it was a very simple thing, a very, a very simple scheme. There, there were going to be two workshops, you were going to receive some budget and you had to produce something in less than two months. And out of the particular collaborative uh, atmosphere that they usually create, uh, you can develop and improve what you have, I mean, the idea that you had in mind. Uh, Entorno a la Silla, um, which is, is a very interesting name. I mean, it has a, 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 a wordplay, a potential wordplay in Spanish. It's either the surroundings of the wheelchair or the, uh, basically how we could discuss on wheelchairs. Um, it all depends on whether you put the space in entorno, uh, in entorno or entorno. So these people basically proposed a kit to activate the surroundings of, the, of a wheelchair. They wanted to transform, grounding on the experience that they had gained occupying the streets, uh, they wanted to intervene, not only wheelchairs, but how we situate uh, around wheelchairs, and also how we can produce buildings together with the people in the wheelchairs. At the time, in that proposal that they created, it was a, a very particular kit uh, made out of three elements. They said the wheelchair should be an agora, cons constructing agora. So it was not that, th that, we, need, that we needed uh, to create a more accessible space for the wheelchair. We needed to change our conception of spaces and gadgets. It's not that gadgets help to include people, it's that we need to transform how we are relating, how we are producing our very relations. And these particularly open uh, gadgets that nobody know about, knew about, I mean, the people that were proposing these, yes, one of them was an architect, the other two were particularly uh, crafty. I mean, they had a very, they were craftspeople. And, um, but they, they knew nothing about technical aids, as, as, as these things are officially called. They knew nothing about what to do with these things. It was a very exploratory project from the very onset. So these are two of the things. A portable wheelchair ramp and an armchair table uh, uh, suitcase. Intervening the very uncomfortable situation of many wheelchairs. Wheelchairs, if you don't know it, are where people uh, basically leave and breathe. People on wheelchairs spend more time in the wheelchair than anywhere else. So you cannot just think of a wheelchair as a chair with, with wheels. It is, uh, it is a habitat for the people. And most of these habitats are really not designed for the people that they should be, in a way, hosting. Um, they are extremely uncomfortable and they, cannot al and they do not allow uh, people to basically store things, like very private things, the wallet or anything. I mean, you might be carrying condoms. I mean, if, you, I mean, you're, if, if this is a, a supposedly uh, an accessible thing, I mean, I think to make your life more accessible, you should be making it accessible to everything, right? Not just to the streets. Um, so that, that was like the biggest proposal. And then uh, I joined the collective as, as an ethnographer. I wanted to make a participatory, uh, uh, sorry, a research on participatory design practices in the domain of care. 
but um, basically my project exploded after I met them and um, I basically carried on uh, being the, I mean in the role that I ha I took in the first uh, meetings which was the documenter I mean everyone there was doing something with their hands contributing with the knowledge that they had uh, what could I do I mean I have a training in documentation, so to speak. Uh, so why don't I take the role of being the documenter of the group? That was the whole approach. But from the very beginning, this was a very puzzling attitude. Uh, because I had to document not only for my research purpose, I had to document for the group. Everything had to be put to the avail of the group. I, everything had to be uh, open. Uh, every picture was to be stored in a Dropbox folder. Everything I, I produced uh, I mean, of course, I had my personal notes, as everyone in the group had, but the documentation was all about what we were all living together. So we started uh, tinkering, cacharreando, and we started thinking of potential uh, ramps. Everyone, I m everyone we met had an idea for a ramp. It was like a, new, it's, it's like a very weird thing. It's like a universal object. Everyone believes they know how to design. But as you can see, the ramps all have very different forms of uh, joining together, folding, not folding, uh, different materials in mind, different forms of uh, displaying and, unf and unfolding them, different modes of putting them in operation, requiring someone, not requiring someone, how many people, to what uh, effect, what is the outcome, etc., etc. So the first attempt was these very rough uh, aluminium and wood uh, prototype that we discussed uh, together with some of, some of the mentors that um, Media Lab was uh, providing us. And after many of the discussions, we ended up having this um, foldable, uh, uh, portable ramp weighing more, I mean, weighing more, less than five uh, kilograms each. So it's four modules, uh, joint, I mean, basically, um, with a joint that helps in the, in the um, folding function. Everything that we did, like I said, was subject to public scrutiny. It, it was always in the open uh, with many different people. Some of them were regular uh, assistants uh, to the workshops, but most of them were not. And like I said, I was not the only one documenting, I was not the only one sharing, I was not the only one taking notes. Everyone was taking notes, everyone was sharing, and everyone was uh, giving ideas. One day, um, and I'm, I'm not going to show you this video, but basically what this video shows is, I mean, one day we were basically discussing how to approach one particular aspect of the whole thing. This guy appeared out of the blue. We didn't know him, I mean, but we were in a public space. Um, so the guy appeared and had a wonderful idea for this. We were basically wondering whether uh, the first approach, which was uh, these two things going together into one another, but they were also very dangerous to manipulate. So how can we do this? I mean, we were all in a very obsessive manner, I mean, thinking about it. And then this guy, like I said, appeared out of the blue and said, I have the best idea, and what you should do is this and that and this and that. And then he basically su um, suggested that we should be creating a folding method, the folding method that you have seen. Someone there, not me, was taking notes. And out of the notes that he was taking, the, the architect in the group started designing first a model. And then we reached these uh, render pictures. <laughs> the interesting thing is that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow on that a little bit in a while. There was a joke. It all started like a joke from this moment on. What I'm going to tell you in, in, in the follow. Uh, do you think that guy is or isn't Leonard Cohen? I mean, that was basically one of the... I mean, someone said, this guy looks like Leonard Cohen. Uh, I'm going I'm to tell you why this mattered. I mean... And the interesting thing is that in this very particular atmosphere, where everyone was sharing notes, sharing ideas, and documentation was ex extremely available, all of these out-of-the-blue ideas were happening all the time. But I'm going to tell you why is this Leonard Cohen uh, joke started having an impact. Like I said, I was the documenter. I had created a documentary ecology 
for many, th I mean, for the whole group. I opened up a blog, um, and together with Ariana Mencaroni, who joined uh, short after, we started producing something of a documentary, a documentary project, a video documentation project, uh, still unfinished, uh, where we basically started producing things, videos of this, videos of that, interviews to this guy who says something interesting. Some of these videos were then uh, seen together with the others, and uh, we even, I mean, the video documentation took its own, um, its own, uh, well, a life of its own. So, something, I mean, with documentation, things happen in a weird way. We were testing one day, this was May 2013. I was the only one having a smartphone camera there. And we were testing the first version of the ramps, uh, brand new. Um, out of the blue, we started searching around, and we found this place in the very, in very, in the very downtown uh, Barcelona, Bar Mundial, uh, with a very high um, step, 24 centimeters. Our ramps were not designed for that uh, high step, but we wanted to try anyway. And uh, I was documenting the whole thing. And just the day after, we published this blog post where not only we showed how we had entered into that part, but we said in Spanish, I'm going to translate from here, uh, the Bar Mundial, which peacefully existed, whoa, what happened, uh, in an inaccessible way uh, since 1925, all of a sudden became accessible. But there is no ramp that could be making accessible its prices. It was a very... Uh, pricey uh, restaurant. That um, blog post created a gigantic uh, debate with our friends in the social networks. We were, e we were even accused of being collaborationists. I mean, we were basically enforcing the regime of inaccessibility by creating a gadget that could allow people to basically not follow the rules and the norms. Uh, building no, uh, norms. So, out of many debates, one day we were discussing how can we say what we are, I mean, what, what, what is it that we are doing with this ramp? Um, so someone said, okay, the ramp is not the solution. What if the ramp is just unfolding the problem? And then we started drafting um, a blog post, and it was Alida, the architect of the group, of the group that one day came with Paul Rabineau's interview to Michel Foucault. It was not me, the anthropologist, the allegedly clever guy showing the you know, interesting quotes about whatever, these and that, and, be, and being always very pedantic. It was the person that had already designed the thing, that had created some of, it, from a, some of its prototypes, that came with an interview where um, basically Paul Rabineau is asking Michel Foucault whether objects have liber liberating, um, could have liberating effects. And Michel Foucault says something of the following. He says, I don't think um, objects have a liberating function. The only condition, the only possibility of freedom is freedom. So the only possibility of being free is if you act freely. Uh, and that was the whole thing that we, in a way, wanted to, uh, that we wrote in that uh, blog post. The ramp was not the solution. It was the unfolding of the problem, bringing others about, so that we could, in a way, attain a collective solution, so that uh, we could all together be free. And things went on and on and on and on, and we were testing the ramps in all kinds of possible ways in the streets of Barcelona, but then we were doing holidays together for uh, some time, and we went into the countryside near the Pyrenees, and we went where no wheelchair has gone before, and uh, we had meals, and we had great fun. Um, but the interesting thing is that the Leonard Cohen joke uh, kept, in a way, in the background. And out of the video productions that we made, one day we produced this video. Here? Oh, I 
Okay, what is this thing you have just seen? Basically, it was a poem by Leonard Cohen, uh, read out loud by um, Oriol Roman, one of our colleagues from the Independent Living Movement in Barcelona. The Leonard, the Leonard Cohen, Cohen uh, joke basically uh, took us to, well, to start like searching for Leonard Cohen things. And uh, interestingly, uh, during the, the Indignados uprisings, there was a, a video that became really famous uh, where one of the main actors that has dubbed people like, like Darth Vader or um, uh, many Clint Eastwood uh, films, um, basically this guy, Constantino Romero, uh, I mean, he made a, a public, uh, like a spoken word sort, sort of um, uh, performance where he was re reading this very same poem. I'm just going to show you a little bit to see, I mean, so that you can check what it, I mean, the, the effect of the, the difference in how the whole thing works, just the sound of it. anyone uh, in Spain listens to this guy, you can hear Darth Vader basically uh, giving orders to the troops. Uh, the effect that we wanted to, in a way, show, it was a joke. We wanted to create a joke out of this whole thing that basically says any system that you contrive without us will be taken down. It's a very 1970s sort of uh, political agitprop uh, kind of uh, uh, video that we made. Um, Interestingly, I mean, I spent with Oriol Roquetas, where I said Oriol Roman, but I was a complete um, mistake. Uh, Oriol Roque, with Oriol Roquetas, we spent a whole afternoon um, um, recording his voice uh, to make it sound like he was reading the poem. Uh, and we made it just to create an audio joke. Uh, 
Um, but we were also, uh, like I said, uh, recording everything that we were making with that ramp. And, one, and the things that we were making with that ramp are something that we call assaults, going to places, unfolding the ramp, and see, seeing what happens. The mixture of these two things only happened just because we were tinkering. We were trying out things. And the things that we were trying out uh, had the effect of bringing about things and effects about what we were doing that we could not understand. Just one minor thing, one of the biggest um, disputes that we had within the group is whether we should be subtitling or not the video. Because if you subtitle the whole thing, basically what you're saying is that you cannot be understood. But we found a trick. We were using basically uh, YouTube. And uh, we decided to upload both the Spanish and the English subtitles. So that, uh, and, and basically the interesting thing is that YouTube uh, allows you to have basically a, a switch on, switch off function. So if there's no need for those uh, subtitles to be completely um, uh, in display all the time. So basically it was like a trick. You can, uh, I mean, what we wanted to display is a video where people had to force their listening uh, so, so that they could understand Oriol when he speaks. He has cere cerebral palsy, so, and, and sometimes some people find it difficult to follow, but after, after a while, if you relate, if you keep on relating, if you stay by his side, then you discover that you can listen to each other, and, then, and he can understand you, and you can understand him, and you, a relation might, uh, might uh, blossom. But then the video was taken to many of the different places. This artist, Jaume Ferrete, uh, who has been playing with voice uh, a long time, basically took it to the Oral Museum of the Revolution, and the ramp uh, on its way got documented into very beautiful um, tutorials that then were displayed in uh, an exhibition created by a recycling uh, collective from Barcelona called Makea, that they host yearly exhibitions with, uh, basically they are hacking Ikea kind of uh, attitude. So on the one hand, we produced a RAM, we produced documentation, we produced tutorials so that anyone could start building the RAM. We produced uh, an account of how the RAM was not a solution but unfolding problems, how you could be creating the RAM for many things. And, and also the video that we produced was having other kinds of effects and, and Jaume Ferrete started using the video in some of the things that he was using like, like voz rara rara rara, uh, uh, odd, 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 odd voice or in even um, in, in, he, in, in, well, in an interview that he was uh, giving to the feminist journal, um, the Spanish feminist journal Picara, on voice ideologies and how we should be making people more uh, used to weird voices, because the weird voices are always what, what, I mean, the ones that are carrying more meanings and other political subjectivities beyond the hegemonic ones, like the one from Constantino Romero. Um, so we were living together. We created a gadget to live together, but we also opened a space to think what we were doing. That is what I would like to explore briefly in the following. So I was the documenter, and sometimes, and this is maybe something like a, a disclaimer for anthropologists, I have always felt very weird about what, what I was doing. Sometimes I was even taking sketches as if I was just uh, a regular documenter, like a technical guy or a technical uh, geek, uh, basically sketching one weird idea that we had. But all of a sudden, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that my picture is the one on the right, and the picture on the left is someone uh, who took a picture to me and sent it to me through WhatsApp, uh, because I, I had always been doing that to them, so it was like, <laughs> We got you, and then sent me the picture of me doing something instead of just recording. But for me, the, juxt the juxtaposition of these two things made me reflect on something I was completely unaware. Or I had been uncomfortable about, but I was, ah, I, I didn't know how to think about it. Uh, was I then producing the notes from the field? I mean, was I producing the field through my field notes? Was I producing the very situation I wanted to study through the very activities I was carrying in there? Because without my documentation, it would have been very difficult to find out some of the things that we had been doing. 
So had I just been creating the conditions for the appreciation of, we had, we had, of what we had been doing? I mean, had I created the object of my research? Where many of the things that uh, at some point it, they were like puzzling, but then I just carried on. I mean, I had been tink tinkering all the time, so why not tinkering a little bit more? This documentary ecology had many different incarnations. We invited, I mean, people doing sketches, people taking pictures. We created our own uh, do it yourself tutorials that were, well, a bit crafty. We even opened up more. Uh, blog posts, I mean, sorry, more blog platforms. Uh, I mean, it was a, everything we did that had a meaning, of course, not everything, everything, all the time, but most of the things that had a meaning received a documentary incarnation. But this is not something that was only happening to us. This was uh, a particular obsession of free culture initiatives in the country uh, that had been become, in, in, uh, out of the Indignados protests, something that everyone had to reflect upon. How do you want to put in circulation or cir circulate what you are doing? How do you want to give it back to the commons? Uh, how can, I mean, how the common knowledge can be, in a way, uh, brought back to the commons? Um, and I have a feeling that, I mean, we need to restore uh, documentation, uh, at least in anthropology. I have a feeling that documentation has never been a, a big thing in, in the arts, but at least in some of the uh, time arts, like dance and, and, and performance arts, um, documentation is crucial for what they are doing because they need to watch what they just did and understand. It has plenty of different effects, but in, in, in anthropology, documentation has been heavily criticized because it, in a way, makes you imagine uh, you know, colonial times where we were basically uh, tagging people, classifying people, classifying diversity uh, all over the earth. Uh, but I have the feeling that maybe the problem was not documentation per se, it was the way we did it and the particular declarative, predicative, uh, objectifying way in which documentation was uh, produced. And, and, and what made me think that is that documentation is a very particular technology of the everyday person whenever they have, I mean, whenever there is a, an issue, whenever there is something that they are uncertain about. And certainly times, I mean, the times of crisis in Spain were highly uncertain. No one knew what was going to happen. And even when you wanted to go to one particular commission in the Indignados encampments, I mean, many of these maps were being produced every day so that you could locate them. So we need to go beyond, I mean, these things were not documentation in, in a declarative mode. They were something else. It was not this and that and this and that and a very physicalist, objectifying way of saying how the world works. I mean, it's not an encyclopedic, uh, enlightened mode of documentation. Um, in a way, I mean, documentation, as, as a one I have been, in a way, engaging in, but also uh, witnessing comes in, me, in many different styles and genres. Um, and I was reminded of that when reading this beautiful book by William Stott, a historian of media. Um, in his book called Documentary Expression and 30s America, what he is in a way displaying is how the 1930s, basically uh, after the 1929 financial crack uh, or in the U.S., so, I mean the documentary, the filmmaking. I mean the, the film documentary as we know it today, by Grierson. Uh, but I mean was invented. But not only that, also documentary novels, autobiographic productions of all kinds, documentary photography, uh, documentary poetry, uh, even participant of observation was, I mean, became popular by the School of Chicago at that very same time. So what William Stott, in a way, is telling is that at that time, people needed to know. So they went and produced many different forms and many different genres and devices of the real. Non-fiction tales, non-fiction narratives, non-fiction accounts, non-fiction um, uh, discourses of all, of all kinds. And well, the book is wonderful, uh, I mean, in showing all of these different modes. But documentation, like I said, has been massively criticized. 
because it, it's, it, it is a form of rhetoric that has no rhetoric. It, it has a, dec a declarativist, in a way, aspiration. It wants to show the world as it is. But I refuse to believe that. I have a feeling that documentation has poetry uh, as well. And poetry in both the textual and the constructive uh, understanding of poiesis, at least you know, from the Greeks, Documentary not only produces accounts in many different genres and styles, it also produces worlds and relations. And you, you, I mean, you can find that in many different approaches to that, from the more ironic uh, depictions of what gadgets are for, to the more physicalist, in a way, like the Moybridge um, um, attempt at describing locomotion. Like I said, it has poetry because it comes in many styles and ways. It can happen hanging on the wall, it can happen a very, I mean, uh, by someone who has been drawing something, showing some things and not others. I mean, it comes in many different ways. And also, in the case of Antonio La Silla, it came in many different ways. Documentation, um, but I mean, it's poetry because you are selecting and inventing at the same time. You're creating frames, you're opening up conditions for something. Even, for instance, this event, Primavera Cacharrera, the Tinkering Spring, one of the main aspirations that we had is that we needed uh, footage for the documentary film that we were working on. And we needed something to happen. All we were recording is people speaking as talking heads. Uh, and, and we told the others, hey guys, I mean, if this whole thing is all about tinkering, we need to show tinkering. But at the same time, this was a very particular hard time for Antonio La Silla between 2013 and 2014. I mean, well, I have a feeling that maybe all times have been bad for Antonio La Silla. It, was, it has always been very precarious and, 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 lack, and lacking any kind of funding. So the thing is, we needed to meet new friends. We needed to, uh, we needed to meet new friends, but also we needed something to be recorded. We needed to enter into new relations or into new conditions of relating, as I will uh, tell you later, later on. Uh, I was not only live tweeting, but also Ariana was basically reporting the whole thing, and we were basically creating a version of what Media Lab Prado does all the time, which is recording everything and then storing it and displaying it in public through a YouTube channel. channel. And then uh, Carla Wasserman, who is a, a friend of ours, who does these wonderful things she calls a relatogramma, basically a narratogram or a graphic uh, account, uh, also produced some of them. Um, but also documentation is process. Is, um, for us, documentation never meant uh, something that you do at the beginning of something. I mean, you document yourself and then you go into the field. And it was not a way of spreading the word. I mean, maybe it was, but all the time. I mean, it's not that you spread the word when everything is already closed down. We were spreading the word all the time, published, I mean, publishing everything that we were making. Not everything, everything, but everything that, I mean, that is because there was selection. We were selecting, but we were, it, I mean, publication wasn't going. Um, and, and the interesting effect that it causes, I mean, you have witnessed it in, 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 in the very example I gave you. Documentation, in a way, punctuates experience. I mean, if you're selecting and inventing, what you are producing, in a way, is a return, a moment of looking at yourself from the outside. Like one of these glitches that, oh, was I doing that? Um, but that is an interesting effect. I mean, the, the French philosopher uh, uh, from hung Hungarian origins, Peter Shendi, has this beautiful book uh, that is unfortunately not in English yet, but it has a, a Spanish translation. Um, where he's basically discussing the, the importance of punctuation and how punctuation, I mean orthographic punctuation, shows how a text should be read, how a text should be interpreted. And, and it's a way of conveying interpretations through symbols and inscribing interpretation in the way in which you are chopping a way in which a text should be read. But that is something very similar to what, for instance, people like Carla Bosserman is doing. She has created this narratogram, this relatogramma, basically in a very uh, systematic way. Um, 
basically she has a methodology for everything that should appear in the pictures that she's uh, pictures with text. Uh, the interesting thing is that she has been documenting uh, free culture in Spain at least for the last six, seven years. Constantly. I mean, she's constantly publishing. A talk she has attended, shh, she uploads the, the picture. Um, but one of the things that she keeps on telling us uh, is that documentation is not external. For her, and that is the second aspect of, that, of this drawing of her methodology, documentation means taking part. And if you're taking part, you are part of the situation. So documentation is not external to her. It's internal to the very situation you're documenting. I hope that is also clear. I mean, when I was showing that picture where I was documenting, and at the same time I was feeling that I was creating the very field, there was this very same strange effect. So my feeling is that if we want to restore documentation, we have to treat it not as an objectifying, distant uh, way of classifying the world in a taxonomic way, as the Enlightenment uh, uh, philosophers did. Or even as many of the computer scientists talking about the documentation of their files, or in, in places like GitHub also do. They believe they are documenting the world as it is. But if documentation is selection, invention, poetry, if what is being created is not only an account but also, documentation is a practice that is internal to the situations. Maybe documentation should be considered a form of relating. Relating in English has a beautiful, has a beautiful um, uh, juxtaposition of potential meanings. You can say that you're relating when you are having social relations with someone. But also, relating is producing an account uh, from the Latin relatare. Relating means producing also relations between things, like in a logical uh, uh, understanding of the world. So you are creating, I mean, producing relations, interpretations of the world, creating accounts to do so, and in a way you are creating relations with others through the particular circulation of these accounts. That is what I believe is happening here. And I was reminded of something like that, watching the practice of another collective. They call themselves Colaboravora. They are from the Basque country. Um, and and uh, they play a lot with anthropology-ish anthropology forms of uh, thinking what they are doing. Um, they basically create many different accounts of uh, collaborative practices across the country. And uh, they even did something uh, that in Basque is called Ondartzan, which is, I, if I'm not really, I mean, I. I I believe it's something related to beach, um, uh, but I'm not fluent. Uh, so they created these uh, several months exploration of collect collective and collaborative practices in the country. And they created a massive documentation of the whole process. But why did, why, why did they do that? They, they created maps uh, where they were, in a way, giving ideas on what collaboration means, its dangers, what you need to know in, in order to create a collaborative project. Uh, they produced gigantic... I mean, this map is, is immense. It, it's something like an A2 uh, picture. Um, they produced that because they believe that we need um, to learn how to relate. And the only way to learn how to relate is creating these tales uh, so that we can start relating with one another. Oh, what happened here? Um, and, and when reading, um, uh, I mean, I, I, but then, I mean, I start thinking, okay, so it's relating, but relating also implies that relations are, in a way, made explicit. If you're showing how you relate, if you're producing tales on how you should be relating, then I mean, I mean, what these people are doing is constantly thinking about how to do things, how to document, how to deal with this, how to show how this thing works, how this thing doesn't work, how to produce a meeting, how to show uh, others uh, the meeting, but also reflecting on the very formats in which they should be sh showing that information. Um, and and. I mean, the, these very interesting uh, Japanese artists, a relational artist called Koki Tanaka, I was reminded, I mean, I, uh, 
I, I mean, it made me think a lot about these, many of these things. Uh, I was introduced to these gu these guy by Rachel Harkness, who hosted a format uh, at a, an event uh, in, last summer in Lisbon. Uh, uh, the event was the colleagues, the collaboratory for ethnographic experimentation, and she wanted to create um, a situation. How would it be to do ethnography between five ethnographers? Basically, she was drawing inspiration uh, from this guy, Koki Tanaka, that after Fukushima started, in a way, creating these kinds of situations. When Fukushima happened, nobody knew how to collaborate. Nobody knew how to do things together. Everyone was helpless. So if we want to activate what it means to collaborate, if we want to understand how we could be collaborating, how to, how to, how to, how to, the only way in which we can do that is creating situations where those things are made explicit all the time. So he creates situations uh, like the one I'm going to tell you now. He puts five piano players together and tells them, play something. All of you five, you have one hour, or you have a few hours to do that. And then he joins that with a gigantic documentation team watching and recording what they are doing. And when you watch the videos, I mean, they are beautiful, they are all in Vimeo, you understand something very important. In order to start doing these things, people need constantly to basically discuss how to do it, how to do it. Okay, but playing a piano between five people, how should we do it? How, how should we be doing it? Should we just sit together and play the same thing? Shall, shall we just, I mean, sh is just one playing the piano and then another comes and then another comes and then another comes? Or should I play the low keys and you play the um, high keys? Or should I play the white ones and you play the black ones? Or The interesting thing is that creating this situation, the conditions of collaboration, the conditions of relating become explicit. And I have a feeling that that is what happens when you have a, a gigantic documentary ecology, uh, which in a way is like a ghost accompanying you. You create a process to co-create, Many people start sharing ideas. Those ideas have a trace. You not only document the ideas, but you document the process of making them happen. You document uh, the minutes of the process. You document how you have hosted the meetings. You document what happened in the meetings. Uh, you document the workshop for the things that you wanted to create. And you create uh, many kinds of documents to show others what you were doing and then you show it in public and then you produce things in paper or in video or you tweet it or you do whatever. The interesting thing is that in this particular free culture ecology everyone is drawing inspiration from others. Everyone is creating and producing versions of things and some other could be producing a reversion of what we have been doing in an ongoing process of relating, where the, the mode in, with, in which we, we relate is producing how-to modes, that is making explicit how we are creating things. And just one last thing to close um, what I wanted to tell you today. The, for me, the most interesting thing is that this mode of relating is not something where, like I said, documentation is external to the very situation that you are producing. If it's not external to the very situation you're producing, documentation should, you know, I mean, is also part of the design object or the design practice that you are undertaking. Documentation can also be part of the thing that you are uh, producing. And the interesting thing um, for us is that these gadgets that we were constructing in Torno La Silla, they were from the very beginning called something. The name that we gave them, taking it, drawing it, creating a new version from what an Argentinian artist called Roberto Jacobi uh, called Technologies of Friendship. That is what we were doing. We were creating gadgets so that we could share things and do things together and prolong our friendship. But also, friendship was being created through documentation in a way, through the people that we met in the debates that we were creating, or in the videos that we were producing, or in the blog uh, ecology that we were creating. All of these things, in a way, I mean, made me think that documentation is uh, a how-to mode 
of design relations, where design relations are shown and they are brought into the very design object that you are creating. So that design objects are not just these, I mean, the, port, the portable ramp that we created was never uh, wishing to be a thing of its own. It produced a debate, a video was created to account for it, you created an, an, an idea about that, you produced an interpretation uh, that called someone uh, into play, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Okay. So, a process whereby people have become highly politicized. And I'm, I'm, on a, I'm, I'm just going to close with this. I'm not going to go very deep into these things. How can you create the conditions for this to happen when you're teaching architects? How can you create that very thing after basically this realization that documentation has this gigantic role into this? Uh, documentation started playing a role for me in every of the design projects that I have been teaching. One of them, called Design Crisis, entailed um, an attempt at putting designers in crisis or in conditions of crisis so that they could learn to design differently. We did that in this particular case. This was uh, the second installment of these designing crises uh, called Coming to Our Senses. Um, we made them uh, basically do five sensory explorations, one week each, where we were basically making them pay attention to other sensory dimensions beyond sight. Sight is the main tool, so to speak, that architects use whenever they are designing. So if you want to put them in crisis, why not blindfolding them? So blindness for us was a method and a way of teaching. They didn't know what they were going to do, to do uh, before uh, the very week uh, that they were going to be, in a way, receiving that teaching. So, and out of these five sensory explorations, um, we make them do something. We make them create a toolkit for a blind architect. We showed them an architect from San Francisco that has become blind and has started designing gadgets to keep on designing. And the interesting thing is that we wanted them to understand that if you are a blind architect and want to keep on designing, the way in which you design and the kinds of spaces that you design and the mode of relating to others that you are, in a way, uh, producing has to be very different. Out of the whole thing, they produced something that uh, they call the manual cut, of which you have here all the documentation of the whole thing. I mean, it was like a, a, a board to design with smells, sounds, and, um, and uh, textures, um, so that you could engage in other kinds of design relations. Uh, in, I mean, if you want to check it, here, uh, these is like the plate. I mean, they, they documented the whole process here, and I have the feeling that the most interesting thing about the manual cat is that, and something that maybe they, they learned, is that documentation can, at the same time, uh, show how you have, I mean, entered into a very particular process. Documentation is a mode of relating to the topic. It's a mode of relating to others that you did not know in advance, and it's also a mode of even relating to, these, to other designers, because most of the times designers have a very individualistic, solution-driven uh, ethos. What if then, and this is only an exploratory thing, what if then documentation can help us relating? And that is what I wanted to tell you today. Thanks. Yeah, um, yes, we have used different uh, Creative Commons licenses depending on, I mean, we had a debate every time we were putting any, any, anything in public. Um, 
um, basically most of the things that we have produced are with the, I mean, I, maybe I need that image. If you're not familiar, I mean, maybe you are, but if the rest are not familiar with the licenses. Um, I mean, with Creative Commons, you basically have to uh, address a few things. You have to address who is uh, these work to be attributed to, so who is the alleged author. Or, I mean, of these version or reversion, it doesn't matter whether you are the original author of anything. Then uh, you can show whether you want the, the der derivative work that someone could make out of what you're doing. Uh, commercial, I mean, having commercial or non-commercial purposes. I mean, people can make money out of it or not. And then you can decide whether they can share the new version or not. And you can even tell that the that they should do as you did, uh, which is the same as. So the interesting thing about these kinds of licenses is that you're entering into a very particular agreement with others. You're telling them how you want that to be circulating. So, and most of the times with Entorno La Silla we have been publishing with the non-commercial uh, same as. So derivatives could happen but with non-commercial uh, purposes. This was not the main thing. In, I mean most free culture is uh, uh, by someone same as. So you can produce any kind of derivative and, and you can create an economy out of it. But in our case, we have always been a bit uh, worried that some gigantic corporations could be uh, taking the idea from us. It was a very difficult thing to create an economy out of this thing. At some point, we even discussed that we wanted to create, I mean, the, we wanted it to have a more, well, we wanted to have more funding to keep on, keep on operating, but at some point we rejected that. So, yeah, I mean, we, but we kept on publishing everything with non-commercial, same as. These are not the only ones. I mean, these are not the only free, uh, free licenses. I mean, they're, they're probably the most popular ones. Why are you interested in this? Yeah, I, I'm interested in open source stuff. And, uh, so I'm wondering if these licenses are uh, good enough or if uh, there's some need to revisit them. Mm -hmm. uh, because in you know, open source, Works quite uh, quite fine, but for the uh, more uh, artistic approach or, or design approach, it might it might fail. Uh, like for example, this non-commercial non use. Uh, you, I, I'm not really well educated in this field, but uh, you can't. It's quite hard to. You can say not no, no commercial, or you, you are free to regulate mm -hmm. for commercial use. But uh, it's it's quite hard, I think, to make some choices. Find some equilibrium. I mean, there are many other licenses that have been created in the last years. <coughs> One um, was proposed in something that was uh, had a very weird name, it was something like the Telecommunist. Uh, Manifesto or something, <laughs> um, and it, basically what they—I mean—it was a, a, a German guy who wanted to ensure that I mean it's not just that whoever can make money is that you. I mean, we need to ensure that we can produce, and and he was basically calling this practice radical copy left or copy far left because uh, he was saying we need to ensure that it's only co-ops and and social collectives that are not gigantic corporations uh, involved uh, in, in the potential new versions of these things. And that has even crystallized in something like the peer-to-peer -peer licenses by the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, and they have been also playing a bit with, with some of these things. I mean, so, I mean you, you're free to copy and remix only if you can show that you are like um, a fair employment uh, organization. Uh, and you can own, you're free to do this and this if your mode of doing um, complies with this or that situation. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to to know whether these things have an effect, uh, a legal effect, but they have an effect in the way in which you relate to others. Um, and yeah. Great. Thanks.
and they, so the, but the, the interesting thing is that they are open to invention. Uh, and in inventing these particular legal frameworks, you're also inventing um, relations with others, the kinds of relations that you want to create, the, kinds, the modes of sharing objects, gifts, and what have you. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about your presentation, but I was really, first of all, I really thank you for a very refreshing and a really fruitful and really powerful presentation. Honestly, I have to say that I was firstly maybe a little bit skeptical when I read firstly the abstract of this uh, meeting, because uh, every time when, I read, when I'm reading the, such a, a lot of the new uh, terms and categories like I don't know, open design and I don't know, how to anthropology, etc., etc., when I read it the first time, I'm every time feeling that like, there is something that is like only, only something that what is now cool or something like that. And uh, I have to really say that I was uh, really, that it was really great and it had everything it had sense now for me and it was really great. And I <laughs> thanks. I passed because, the test. <laughs> also because you never use I think the word during your presentation the word I don't know project or that it's your project to I don't know to to make this research or to deal with this and this mm -hmm. or that you never use the term like or platform. Yeah. Okay. Or, uh, for example, I don't know that you en entered uh, or that you entered the field or something like that. It was in this also uh, how you use the word or uh, which categories you use. It was, I think, very, very inspiring, maybe also. And I want to ask because you never, you actually create some kind of horizontal world between you and your like friends now, probably. <laughs> And I want to ask you uh, if this, if this not project, but this, uh, what did you create together? If it still somehow continues in other way, not now in some uh, applied way that you are. If, if it still somehow works, I mean, if you are still in you know, friends and you continue in some work, and if if, uh, if do you this work somehow use in Milton now, for example, or? If you can say something more about that. Oh. Yeah, I can. Well, thanks for what you were saying. Um, I mean, uh, many people, uh, in a way, always ask... Uh, I mean, I mean and, and it has become very, you know, it has even become a way in which we talk about our, our field work. These people we were hanging out with for a year, they became our friends, and so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, in, in, in my case, I, I, um, I believe it was the case. I mean, it was a very intense thing. It was not a one-year thing. It was something I have been doing for at least, I mean, three fully uh, implicated years. And, and, uh, and I have been, I mean, we are very good friends. I mean, we've seen each other cry and, you know, uh, we, we've been through very hard times together. And, had fights and and we keep uh, having a very respectful relation with each other. I mean, and and, and we, I mean, and we would love to keep on doing things together. I mean, the most interesting thing for me is that en torno a la silla, which would be the surroundings of the wheelchair, it created its own environment. I mean, I mean, we produced the very surroundings of the wheelchair, and and um, but I, I mean, I have to. Say, I, I also have to say something. I mean, it's not that we were all equal. And that was also a very, well, the very premise of the whole project. Um, I still feel uh, bad when I am, you know, traveling the world, showing the project in English and, and, and discussing some of these things without the others somehow benefiting from it. Uh, I also, but I, I also have the feeling that that was also in a way some, well, my function. I always try to do it in the open so that whatever I can say or however I could be making interpretations about these things, I mean, they could be disputed, uh, either in public or in private. And, and many, I mean, it, it, has, it has already happened. I have had to recant some of the things, even you know, rewrite some things and try to change stuff that I had said. I mean, we, 
we are friends, but like most friendships, uh, we are unequal. Uh, we have different conditions, we have different conditions of... Uh, I mean, we could travel through different kinds of spaces uh, using different dispositions of he hegemony. We are listened or not because of those situations in different uh, environments. Uh, and yeah, we would still love to do something uh, together. I mean, we are still in contact. I mean, we uh, haven't closed the project uh, because it was never conceived as a, as a bounded thing. It was the beginning of something. And I, I also reckon that some, I mean, things like these, these are really uh, singular very difficult to find and, and I also I'm really afraid that I, I mean the story that you might get out of this is that you know six uh, geeks joined and they became friends and uh, they were having fun I mean I have the feeling that this is not only something that has been happening to them but to many other projects of the same span um, well, I'm, I'm speaking in circles. I don't know whether I, I replied to what you were interested in. Maybe I Do, do we have two hours no. <laughs> 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 Oh, okay. Let yes, I mean, uh, not only me, but uh, the um, functionally diverse activists. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, we all were, but. Okay, yeah, the, the people from the independent living movement that are fighting for personal assistance and, 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 and these things that I've been uh, working with um, for this. Um, I mean, they, they are very... I know that this is a very particular... I mean, they have a very particular standing. I mean, they are all... Most of them literate. I mean, most of them have at least BA training. Um, I mean, some of the guys that you have been seeing here in, what, in wheelchairs, they have BAs in mathematics, sociology, uh, social education, and what have you. Uh, so these people are intervening in that debate, at least at a vernacular Spanish uh, domain. And they have been producing books and writing their own interpretations of disability studies and even uh, disputing the not only, I mean, the, like the critical model of disability that has become really uh, like the mainstream thing in, in the Anglo-Saxon or English-speaking, better term, less racist, in the English-speaking uh, world, um, which contends that we should be pushing for something that they call the social model against the medical rehabilitating uh, rehabilitative uh, model. I mean, we should treat um, disability as, an, as a social effect of the ways in which we have built the world, uh, I mean, symbolically and materially, uh, and we should not treat these bodies as, as uh, disabled because of a biological condition, but because of the ways in which we have built the world for them. So disability is an, an effect of uh, disabling the society. I mean, these people are not really, I mean, I mean so the, the people in, in, in Spain from the independent living uh, movement, they have coined the new term, functional diversity, because they also believe in a different way of approaching things. The social model usually strives for inclusion, inclusion, accessibility, and so on. And they are pushing for something they call the model of diversity. It's not just that they should be... Uh, having access to places or, uh, I mean, because if you have a ramp and nobody listens to you whenever you enter a place, 
the regular legal driven solutions do not work. Uh, so it's not just building gadgets, it's not just creating further social conditions for things to happen for them. I mean, they want to live in diversity. They want to live with others, they want to do things with others, they want to have sex with others, they want to enjoy life with others. It's not just that they want to be accepted, included, treated uh, well, and whatever. I mean, so it, it, it's, it's them that have been intervening in that domain. I mean, and, and most of what I have been trying to do is, uh, of course, I engage with the literature in disability studies. I even um, engage in some of the journals of disability studies. Uh, but what I like is this particular non-identity -polit non politics that the people I have been in contact with since 2011-2012 uh, do. I mean, they do not call what they do identity politi politics. It's not creating better conditions for the disabled. They're saying you're also uh, losing something where we, when we are not part of situations. It's not just us who should be included in your beautifully uh, rich world. Your world is poor without us. Um, that would be more or less the, um, the model of diversity for them. Uh, your, I mean, yeah, your world is lacking something without us. Uh, you, we should be making it richer. Uh, I find it a beautifully challenging idea, to be honest. Uh, very difficult to, to attain. But, I mean, like many things, if you don't test it, you will never find whether this is true or not. Are there any art-related people in the room? Someone who f might have something to say about the, I don't know, the quality of these gadgets or the uh, unfinished aesthetics of the whole thing? <laughs> or even about the whole redistribution of creativity happening here, when it's not just creative genius bringing beautiful things into the world. Because those are some, some of my, most of the times, like the, the uh, oppositions to these things. These objects are rather ugly, uh, unfinished, raw, uh, too DIY, uh, and even created by everyone and anyone in any kind of situation. Do, do any of you find that troubling or problematic? No? <laughs> Maybe I have one more question yeah. on a practical level. Uh, all, all presentation I was just wondering that it's just a miracle that uh, it just works. That you know, uh, that you have some uh, some leader or manager or somebody who is who is like pushing pushing it and keeping the collective together, or or it was just a, really a miracle that you, you had like a group of uh, ten people who are willing to work hard and contribute to the, to the project. Uh, okay, I need to say a couple of things before I reply. The first one is um, the working hard has not happened all the time and not uh, by the same people. Uh, when I was showing you this picture, I have the feeling that for me the temporalities at play uh, also work a bit like this. Someone was highly into doing something at some point, then left it, and then had to leave for work. Uh, some other was highly into something else at some point and then had to leave and, and do some other stuff. Then sometimes we met and, and, month, and, and some other times months passed without anything happening. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it has been a highly discontinuous kind of way of working together. Of course, like in any group, uh, sometimes there are, there are one or two people that uh, carry on their backs, uh, not 
I wouldn't call it leadership, but the responsibility of bringing the group, the group back into operation. Um, sometimes it has been me, uh, who I sometimes became super obsessed and, and so enthralled. Because I have to, I mean, I, I have no problem in saying that probably this is one of the most meaningful things I've done in my whole life. Uh, and that I find that it will take me a long time to find something as meaningful as this, if I am ever so lucky to find something like this. Um, <clears throat> that is why I sometimes felt, and, and sometimes that, I mean, there were jokes about that. Okay, the documenter, you know, when everyone leaves, just switch off the lights, right? I mean, I, I was feeling sometimes during that role, but I was not the only one. Some, sometimes it was the people, I mean, because the thing is that nobody entered the group without uh, becoming something like a, a self-managed guinea pig, I mean, like a lab rat. So everyone on wheelchairs that has been part of the group has uh, been part of a process of uh, crafting something, maybe for that person. Uh, so it was part of the inclusion. The technology of friendship in operation was creating something he or she would use and we could be together while he or she would be using it. Not in this ins instrument, I mean, not in this utilitarian way, but I mean, that was sort of the, the um, requirement for everyone that wanted to do something with us. We needed to create the conditions so that we could become friends. Uh, but oh, I mean, it was some of the t some other times it was the architect that at some point and everybody was backing her uh, I mean she wanted to make a living out of this uh, as anyone having a creative profession you know I've been doing this I'm enjoying it I like what I do I think I'm bringing something interesting into this domain why couldn't we turn the collective into a, a an economic agent. I mean, we could make money out of it. Sometimes it hasn't worked properly, um, but I mean, some other times we have been giving presentations in public. Uh, we were crafting together the, I mean, the, the tale that we wanted to, to give, in, I mean, the paper that we, that we wanted to give, and most of the times we were really adamant that it should be someone on wheelchairs reading it in public together with us uh, for both performative and ethical reasons. Uh, if we wanted to talk about the effects of something like this, we needed it to be heard from the mouth of one of the members of the collective that was in wheelchairs. And also the message uh, had a different uh, reception. I mean, it was, it was way more powerful if the message was conveyed by that person. Uh, some of the most charismatic leaders, uh, I mean, we've had some, uh, and, 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 and maybe, I mean, some people say that we have been designing together with the posh disabled of Barcelona, not with the run down uh, people that are, yeah, not like, yeah. So these people that we have been working with are the wow, super elite of disability rights in the country. Um, but I have the feeling that some of them have become really interesting charismatic figures. I mean, some initial members of the collective had, have then become public, public figures in, in their own. I mean, Xavi, one of the wheelchair designers, craftspeople on wheelchairs, has now a TV show on the local television in Barcelona where he's I mean, he, has, he created a gadget to motorize uh, his uh, manual uh, wheelchair. And he's, with that motorized, I mean, a very fancy thing, he's showing uh, the accessibility or inaccessibility of Barcelona. And, and uh, I mean, he has a, something like a 15, 20 minute uh, show uh, every week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, some other has become the, I mean, like the main heart, so to speak, of sexual assistant debates 
and the role of sexuality and uh, with diverse bodies and he has been producing and making one documentary and ha and is now one of the stars of a film made together with a very interesting uh, filmmaker that uses uh, docufiction and I mean the film is now on display it's called uh, Living and Other Fictions and it can be seen in many festivals across Europe I mean There are many different leaderships, many different forms of, you know, dragging uh, the project into some things and some others. And uh, until now, we have operated under the conditions of what the people in the Independent Living Forum in Barcelona call uh, diversocracy. Everyone or anyone can do whatever he or she wants unless someone criticizes it um, so that we could profit from anyone's initiative. It's a very weird mode of operation, I know, but um, I hope I, I made it a bit clearer. Is it? Sorry for the length. I, I know I speak too much. You are so fast, so. More content in less time. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comment, question, reaction? Or and if you prepare, you can go to the beer. And then you can comment. Yes. Yeah. Critical comment. <laughs> People as social lubricant. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. It has been uh, an honor to be here. Thank you.